Today, we're gonna to be dealing with a little bit of an interesting issue, which is what speed does downforce actually start working? Now, obviously this is something that's debated a lot on the internet, and I myself copped a lot of flack for when I said that on a road car, downforce doesn't work until you're going really fast because you can't feel the difference. Now, what we really need to define between here is what speed is actually doing something and at what speed you can actually notice something. So as far as downforce goes, the basic concept of downforce is you have aerodynamic force pushes down on your car, okay? If you watch my video on tires, you'll know that as the normal load on the tires increases, your grip increases. The gist of that is more downforce equals more G you can pull into a corner. Now, our force in a corner, our centripetal force that we need to pull ourselves into any corner equals mv squared on r, mass times velocity squared divided by the radius of your corner. From this, we can see that if we increase this force and mass is constant and the radius of the corner is constant, our velocity through the corner will increase. So we want to increase our grip force. We can do that by increasing our downforce. So with that out of the way, we know now more downforce equals more grip but exactly how much more grip does it equal? So, when we talk cars, we talk about CL and CD. CL, coefficient of lift, CD, coefficient of drag. So, for three sample cars here, let's talk CL and A. Now, A is something that's not very well discussed. It's the frontal area. And people quote CD figures, you see a lot of it for efficiency, and everyone's like, oh yeah, this car's more efficient because it's got a lower CD. Not everyone factors in the area component. You can have the lowest CD in the world, but if your area is three times the size of the other cars, you've got more drag. And it's the same thing for downforce. Let me demonstrate my point. Formula One cars generally evaluate off a common area of about 1.47 meters squared. That's the frontal area. On this, they have a CL of around negative 3.6, and that is quite a lot of downforce. A one-to-one, -one, the Koenigsegg, will have a CL of 0.9 across an area of two. Now this was what I calculated for my aerodynamics of hypercars series. And we can see that this is quite a bit less downforce than a Formula One car, even though we've got more frontal area of the car to work with. Something like the Shadow Race Engineering buggy has a downforce coefficient of negative 1.8, which is decently high given it doesn't have much ground effect, but it has a frontal area of two. And this means that its downforce is actually around 80% that of a Formula One car. It's not that it's more efficient, it's that it's just using brute force with more area. So you can think about your CL in terms of sort of aerodynamic efficiency of how much downforce you're getting per unit area. And then your CLA, which is your CL times your A, as your total downforce for a given car. Of course, now you're asking, now that you know about the CL and the A, how does this all play into how much downforce we're making? Formula for downforce, very simple. So your downforce equals a half times rho, density of air, V squared, velocity squared, C, L, A. Okay, so this is the CLA I was telling you about from before. This part of the equation is easy enough. This is pretty much always a constant. You can assume that the density of air is usually about 1.225 kilograms per meter cube, about. And then you can just see that the force is proportional to the velocity squared times your CLA. So going back a bit, we can see that our grip or our friction force equals mu n, coefficient of friction times the normal force. So this normal force equals mass times the gravity plus the downforce. So we've got mg plus a half rho v squared CLA. So that's what we've got for that. But our frictional force into the corner is also equivalent to our centripetal force, which is mv squared on r. Now I know most of you aren't that into math, so I'll just skip the derivation of this and just show you the output. So from this we can see that the velocity equals the square root of your mass times gravity, which is your weight, divided by your mass over your coefficient of friction times your radius, 
minus your effective downforce term. And so from this we can see increasing the downforce is going to just make this term on the bottom smaller, which increases your cornering velocity. Same for increasing the grip. Decreasing your mass is going to increase your cornering velocity because this is going to cause this to drop off at a faster rate, which basically shows the downforce is more effective the lighter your car is. And this was the whole reason why I was talking about it and do car spoilers actually work, how heavier road cars don't work that well with downforce. So now we've got the theoretical basis covered, let's have a look at what some actual downforce figures are at speeds and what sort of contribution they're making to cornering speeds. Okay, so what I have for you now is actually my own proprietary lap simulator that I use for my aerodynamic consulting work. Now at the moment it's set up for the SRE buggy. So we've got a CL of negative 1.89, CD of 1.2, so really high, and a weight of about 900 kilos. Now, this chart here is the interesting one from downforce. So what this is, is this is an indication of your three main accelerations. So we're looking at the braking acceleration there, the red line, the blue line, which is the lateral acceleration or your cornering acceleration, and the green line, which is your straight line acceleration. So we can see that this is on dirt, so very low tire grip. Okay, we're looking at only about sort of 0.7 of a, um, for a mu value. And we can see that as the speed is increasing, we have more grip. Now, in this case, this is, like I say, dirt case, low friction, big downforce. We can see that at 100 k's an hour, we're getting towards 1 g. So we've gone up almost 0.3 of a g by 100 k's an hour. But at 200 k's an hour, we're at sort of 1.7, 1.8 G. So we've more than doubled our cornering G by going up to 200. And it would only increase from here. The thing to notice is there's a light car at 900 kilos that's with passengers and fully fueled. So as you increase your car weight, a 1500 kilo car would only experience about 60% of this sort of improvement of downforce. Now just in terms of what this can mean for lap times, if we start off with a lap time of 154 seconds around the track that I've got in at the moment, and we increase the CL from negative 1.89 to two, we can see our lap time has gone down by about 0.6 of a second. Now that's a pretty substantial gain in competitive racing. Of course, what does that equate to in terms of cornering speeds or that extra downforce? If we have a look here, at our cornering speeds with uh, the standard negative 1.9 um, CL, we can see that we're at about a 30 meter corner radius is about 53 k's an hour, 17 meter corner radius, 40 k's an hour, and a 100 meter corner radius at 109 k's an hour. Now, if we are to increase that to negative two, you'll notice that we really haven't changed that much. We're at 53, 39 still, we go up to 110, it's not a big difference. It's not something you'd really feel that much and you'd have to be a top game driver to notice. But if we remove the downforce completely, we can see that our speeds, while they don't change much in the low speed corners, it's still 51, 38, not much of a big change. So we can see that around this 50k an hour mark, even with a really light car with a lot of downforce, we're not seeing much difference. In the 100 meter corner, we've dropped from 110 k's an hour to 94 k's an hour. Now that is an enormous drop, that's 16 kilometers per hour. Around this mark, the 100k an hour mark for this car, we're seeing substantial differences from downforce. I also have a handy plot for you using that formula I derived earlier. This is cornering speed versus cornering radius. So that's your cornering speed in k's an hour versus the radius of your corner. Now with downforce, we get this really interesting profile, but I'll just show you what it's like without downforce for a second. You can see that as the speed increases, we kind of have this linearized. But the second you add downforce, as your car's going faster, you now actually have more force available at your tires. And you can see we get this point of inflection, whereas the radius is increasing, you're increasing your cornering speed at a much increased rate. And this is the thing that people talk about when they say you have to drive faster with aero. It's not just for the tire heat, it's because of this. In saying that, you'll notice that you still need a bigger radius corner to go faster, which goes against what Top Gear says where it means you've got to drive through the corner at 100 or you would have spun off. Not true, okay? The faster you go, you will need a wider radius corner. But 
you can see the trend from downforce versus no downforce. Just for a final thing now, I'd like to bring it back to applicability for road cars. I've put in the weight of a WRX here, 1700 kilos with passenger and fuel, and I'm going to basically show you how the downforce doesn't make a real difference, okay? If we look here at our Gs, we have a zero downforce, 0.7 G for all our conditions, except for braking, where your braking gets better as you go faster due to drag. Now, if I increase that coefficient of lift to what a Koenigsegg 1 to 1 makes, which is 0.9 on a 2 meter frontal area, we can see that at, at 200 k's an hour, which is really a fast corner, we're making 0.1 of a G more, which really is not that much when you consider the speed and the sheer amount of downforce we're talking there. Like that's a Koenigsegg one to one, big wings, strikes, all that crap. If we look at more what a WRX would actually be making in terms of downforce, which is probably closer to the sort of negative 0.1 mark optimistically, we can see that the, the total difference in G of what you can corner at at 200 k's an hour, so this is cornering, is 0.01 of a G, is the only difference. So if you only have a conservative error setup, it's not gonna do much for you at any sort of reasonable speed. Conservative error only works at stupidly high speed. If you wanna corner at low speed with serious traction, you need serious aero, because otherwise it's just not gonna do anything. Like, look at that, almost nothing. Well, thanks for watching. Hopefully that wasn't too complicated and clears up a little bit of stuff for people. Um, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and hopefully see you next time.